to start out with don't ask permission because that's where we're going to end up and I want you to know where we're going. Along the way, I'm going to talk about a few ideas and uh, some different things, but this talk is really about you. And when I say you, I, I don't mean the entire audience, I mean you specifically. Uh, now, I don't know who you are uh, exactly, but I know that you're, you're out there. Uh, and what you're going to learn is that uh, there is a, a network of globally uh, do-it-yourself problem solvers um, that is a, a top secret network that has uh, grown out of the movement of hackers that began in the 50s and uh, extended uh, to us today, uh, including you. Uh, and you're going to learn that it's not really top secret and that you're already in it. I started something in San Diego called the Fab Lab, which is uh, the idea is to bring the power of rapid prototyping down to the community level. So in a Fab Lab, you have electronics, you have materials, you have uh, tools, you have incredibly precise computer controlled milling machines, all with the aim of giving to the people in the community the ability to make anything that they can imagine, uh, with the, the aim towards actually creating local solutions for local problems. So uh, when we got this uh, amazing resource, I wanted to make sure that it was used to its fullest. So I wanted to look out there and see, well, you know, what's been done? What, what have people made that have really provided these solutions uh, you know, for, for these kinds of problems? And when I started doing my research, every path I went down led to, to this. Uh, this structure is called a hexayurt. It's made from very cheap materials, uh, materials that can be mailed flat anywhere. It can be assembled without the use of tools uh, in any environment. So if you have people who have been evacuated after a flood uh, or a refugee camp, anything like that, the hexayurt can go there and it's designed specifically for those situations to provide temporary housing for uh, up to several months at a time. Very cheap, insulated, uh, very useful for those types of situations. So, I, but I kept running into it and it surprised me. I would read something about Pakistan and, and at some point they mentioned the Hexayurt. Or I read something about Iceland and the Hexayurt would come up. I, I look and I see that the, you know, there was some kind of meeting uh, addressing these kinds of issues at the Pentagon several weeks before that and there was the Hexayurt. And not only the Hexayurt, but the name Vinay Gupta, who is the designer who came up with this innovation. Um, and as I looked more, I realized that it wasn't just Vinay Gupta's name that was showing up uh, time and time again, but there were these other names popping up, and I began to get the sense that these folks were somehow connected to Vinay Gupta, that there was some kind of thread uh, that, that brought these folks together. Uh, that was the first time that I began to sort of be aware that there might be something like this, uh, this network of DIY problem solvers uh, emerging. As I studied it more, I realized that this network sort of started to become solid after September 11th. Right? September 11th was a, a time where the United States was momentarily crippled, and folks looking on uh, remember seeing the images of the president um, reading a, a picture book about a monkey. Right? So folks saw that and, and they sort of connected to the, the, the Hans Christian Andersen story about the emperor's new suit and they said, well, you know, maybe the emperor really doesn't have any clothes um, and perhaps we ought to try to figure out how to do some things for ourselves. When the levees broke in New Orleans, uh, again, the world is watching and, and days and days go by and people who need help obviously are not getting that help. And uh, it was a time where, again, th this perception that maybe uh, government would fail us when we need it most uh, started to grow. And the nodes in this network that Vinay Gupta was a part of also started to grow. In fact, uh, some people who are a part of that network, folks who were community wireless internet uh, evangelists, yes, there are such people, um, those folks uh, went to, to uh, the Katrina affected areas very soon after the storm, and they were the folks to establish a communication system that people could use to communicate uh, with their, their loved ones and, and, and for emergency first responder communication as well. Um, so they were a part of, of this, this globally active community. Um, 
No. So how did we get there? How do we get to that, that situation? Uh, information wants to be free. free. Information wants to be free. Please raise your hands if you've heard this phrase before. Okay, there are a few of you out there in, in the audience. This is a, a phrase that has become associated with uh, hacker culture and is something that has actually penetrated our popular culture now. The idea is, is that uh, coming from the, this original hacker culture in the 50s at MIT, um, it's connected to sharing knowledge, that you should share knowledge as freely and as widely as possible, and that by sharing that knowledge, you then create more knowledge, right? That it shouldn't be kept in silos. Going back to the, um, the Katrina example, uh, when the earthquake happened in Haiti, another group, uh, a, second, a different, entirely different group of community wireless internet evangelists went to Haiti and they established the first communication system there after the, after the catastrophe. And uh, last I heard, what they put there in place is still today being used as the, as the foreground or as the, the foundation for the communication system that they're using in Port-au-Prince right now. So um, let me give you another example of how this, uh, this idea or these ideas that came from these guys in the 50s at MIT have bounced against our contemporary culture. This is, a, this is a, a toy whistle that came out of a cereal box. You can probably guess what kind of cereal. Um, and it was uh, something that became associated with a person who became famous in the 70s known by the name of Captain Crunch. And Captain Crunch was the first phone freaker. And what he did is he figured out a way to use this whistle to produce the same tones that the phone company used to uh, initiate and route phone calls. And when he figured this out, he shared his, his knowledge widely to the point that uh, it, it ended that folks all around the world, phone freakers, were able to, to get on, on the phone uh, with each other and have these massive group conversations from pay phones uh, throughout the globe uh, without having to pay anything. Right? Uh, so th that, that's Captain Crunch. And, uh, Captain Crunch was a part of, of, of this process here. I wanted to hit on the principles that Captain Crunch uh, was uh, acting upon, and because they're important to uh, this globally um, active do-it-yourself network of, of problem solvers, and for you, and like I said, you know who you are, I'm not sure yet, but for you, uh, understanding these principles is important if you decide you want to do something and you want to plug into this network. So. Uh, Crunch, um, like I said, did his, his thing in the 1970s. I arrived here in San Diego, uh, you know, nearly 30 years later, and immediately uh, got involved with a group uh, who put on these uh, incredibly uh, exciting parties, all night parties, uh, at a loft downtown San Diego, a three story loft. Uh, and they would do that uh, night and day, actually. But beyond that, there was also a live workspace. And uh, for me, it was like a, a candy store because they had uh, in this place the most advanced technology. They had the fastest computers. They had uh, the greatest video editing software. They had a, amazingly sophisticated audio production equipment and, and studios, stuff that they would all make available for free to anyone who elected to become a member of the community. And becoming a member of the community was free. So, uh, so one night, we're there late night, and there's a knock at the door. I uh, open the door, and there's a, a snaggletooth, wild-haired man who's looking far older than he possibly could be at the door, and it was Captain Crunch. And Captain Crunch came into this place, the loft, and actually ended up living there for, I think, uh, close to a, a year. And it, you know, if, when you, if you were there, if you're walking around, it might have seemed a little incongruous that there was this, this guy um, looking like he did, which was quite a sight, you know, kind of hanging out with these kind of mostly 20-something kind of raving crowds. Um, uh, but the principles that, that Captain Crunch uh, sort of handed down to us were exactly the things that we were doing at the loft, right? Um, this idea of sharing this technology was something that they actually did under a program that they called liberated technology, um, right? Built into that word, this idea of things being free, uh, of freely sharing. So, um, you see Crunch here in the middle. Before him came uh, 
a group uh, at MIT uh, that actually was, was known as the Tech Model Railroad Club, and they were the first hackers hacking on mainframe computers, and they put out these notions of unlimited and unrestricted access to knowledge, um, the idea that anyone who can do it can do it, right? You don't need a degree. You don't need a badge. You don't need a title. Uh, if you can do the work, you should do the work, especially if you can do it well. Um, and then share your work and ideas freely. Captain Crunch, um, there were any number of people that were greatly influenced by these ideas that I could have picked in the 70s, but uh, Captain Crunch I picked, and then also Richard Stallman. Um, both of them significant in, in, their, uh, in different ways. Richard Stallman co uh, contributes something very significant to the Linux operating system, and over the past couple of decades, the Linux operating system, which is something that can be shared freely, um, you know, without cost, and, and the knowledge of, of working on it and assembling it can be, is also shared freely. It's something that has changed the business world over the past couple of decades, right? Um, so both uh, Stallman and, and Captain Crunch added something to these principles that, the, uh, that were established by in the 50s, and that is this, uh, this thing that I call encroachment, meaning that they both, in, in, in their own way, Captain Crunch, obviously a little more illicitly, than, uh, than Richard Stallman, um, went places that folks didn't necessarily want them to go, right? The door that Richard Stallman opened wasn't something that the uh, corporate world at the time necessarily wanted him to open. So you take the, those original principles, add to it this idea of uh, maybe being thinking that you can go places that maybe folks say you shouldn't, um, and that extends through the 80s and 90s and leads us to you and the rest of this network, the network that produced the Hexa Yurt, and also uh, what I'm about to talk about, Batman. I promised you in this talk that it would be about uh, hacks, shacks, and bats. This is the bat section of the program. Um, Batman. Batman uh, is actually an acronym, and it's an acronym that, that stands for a better approach toward mobile ad hoc networking. And what that means isn't so important. The important thing about it is it's a set of instructions or a protocol, if you were, for uh, getting, machines to getting machines to communicate with each other very effectively and very efficiently. Um, now, I bring up Batman at this point because I'm going to take you from uh, the theoretical working in the network to actually things that you can see how you can put yourself into. Batman um, is a part of a technology that the educational program that I, I bring to communities called Designers for Humanity um, is going to use a little bit later on this summer, working with partners uh, up north a little bit, the Tribal Digital Village, and with a researcher from Australia, his name is Paul gardner Stephen, Dr. Paul gardner Stephen. Um, and what Dr. Paul has done is he's taken uh, this Batman protocol and added to it other, uh, the Batman protocol, which was created by a hacker society in, in Germany called Freifunk, uh, Fry being the German word for free, uh, and obviously it's something that's shared. Uh, it's a part of what people call free and, and open source software, so that people can not only use it, but they, they can look under the hood and see how it works. And Paul in Australia has taken this, and he added, added to it multiple other sets of things that other folks have done and shared openly and put them together, uh, including the Android operating system, which probably powers a lot of the phones that you guys have here today. Um, he's put that stuff together to answer a question that we had here for San Diego. And that question was, um, how can we help people communicate uh, when there's a catastrophic wildfire and the telephone lines are down, the cell phone towers are, are down, and the power lines are down? How can we get, have people be in touch for, so that they can get the critical information? And what uh, Paul has done in Australia is put all these, these free open things together and package them, Android system and phones that you can take off the shelf, and created uh, software that you can put on the phone that will allow the phones to simply create a network with each other. So from phone to phone to phone, you can create a fairly wide area network, and you can essentially make calls completely without the use of telephony infrastructure. So that's something that we're going to be doing a demo up in the area around uh, Ramona, um, uh, Ramona Valley C Center, uh, those areas uh, over the summer, and uh, you can plug into that if you like. Here are some other things that you can plug into. 
I'll start out talking about Patch Bay. Patch Bay is uh, an online, uh, well, so it's a website that allows people to take information that they get from their own sensors or measuring devices and plug that information directly into the internet so it can be viewed by anyone in the world. So they can connect uh, what they have in their homes to the internet. You can go to the web page and you can see what's being streamed out of that in real time. One of the significant ways this was used recently was after the tsunami and earthquake in Japan, right? J Japanese citizens were putting up their own readings from their own Geiger counters and other radio radiation sensing devices that they had so that people could go to this website and see uh, you know, how that data that they were seeing from this guy's apartment and that woman's rooftop and outside the park of someone else's place, how that compared to what was being talked about in the media and uh, what we were being told by the Japanese government. We have, we need is, is uh, another sort of program like that. Uh, it's actually a part of something that my friend Katie Rass, who directs uh, Fab Lab San Diego, um, works on with an, another group of pe people. She works uh, to collect these different software tools uh, to help people who are on the ground in crisis situations. Uh, we Have, We Need is one of them. We Have, We Need uh, allows folks who have resources to list what they have, and folks who need resources, particularly people who are on the ground after a catastrophe, to say what they need. And in that way, these folks can see it, and you can get the stuff that's needed to the people that need it, that need the stuff, right? Uh, which seems to make a lot of sense, but there are any number of times that you may have heard of, of times that we've had catastrophes and supplies have not gotten to people where they need to go. Um, we have, we need help solve that. Uh, so those are both kind of, you know, big global problem solving things. Here's something that, that you all can participate in that is uh, locally based. Um, C Click Fix sets up a website and it's very localized. It what it allows you to do is report any problem that you have noticed or that concerns you in your community. You put it on the website and it connects the message to the person in, or agency in your local government who should be responsible for fixing this problem. While it's up there, you can monitor you know, what their progress is as well as you can see other people who are reporting that they have the same problem or they've experienced it or maybe they have a solution. So it creates a little community around your issue and it's something that anyone uh, can do. And when you do, uh, you become a part of this, right? So this is a network and my apologies that it's not necessarily anatomically correct, but you are up there. I don't know which one of these is you, but, but you are there. And so you, you may ask, uh, so th does using the internet make me a part of this network? Does participating in like crowdsourcing stuff where people take my information and use the data in something, does that make me a part of this network? No, those are different things, right? The, the importance of this network is you being an agent, right? It's your agency. It's, uh, it's the people that make the network, right? The power doesn't lie in the circuitry, it lies in the heart of the people who are using the network, in your heart. So, I have to, to don't ask permission. This is not a statement of opposition. It's not a statement of, of resistance, right? The emperor, he's butt naked. This is not about him. This is about you. When you, when you see something going wrong, you see a problem, you say to yourself, oh, what can I do, right? You're not really asking yourself, what can you do? Because you know what you can do. You know what your capabilities are. You know what your resources are. You're really asking, can I do this? And that's asking permission. So, don't ask permission get started, get fixing, and get it done. The help you need is already out there, just waiting for you to connect.